making sure people did uh, self-isolate, that vulnerable people got the support uh, they needed, at the same time keeping some uh, basic services going, really important crucial services like uh, refuse collection when in the early days certainly the staffing was very much down it took a few weeks before it returned and we started to be able to get services back to normal but there were a range of services that had to keep going clearly a lot of services and uh, like libraries where the face-to-face -face element that was closed down but even in libraries that they very rapidly put in, in place an enhanced virtual off offer contacting regular uh, library customers and so on to make sure that they could uh, support people. Probably for the uh, council, the biggest single effort uh, was the ones that went into, uh, so that's, I said ones, and then, uh, the, probably two areas. Uh, social care, where in order to create more hospital capacity for intensive care cases, uh, we were able to support people into a, a, a caring situation, but out of hospital very, very quickly uh, using something that's called discharge to assess. So you discharge uh, people first, you do their uh, care assessment very rapidly after, but after they've been out there, make sure people are supported. The other big effort was of course, uh, making it possible for uh, rough sleepers, um, uh, single homeless people who were on the streets, uh, to be able to have somewhere to go where they could both stay but also uh, be socially isolated at the same time. So big efforts in, in, into that. Uh, very complex picture really. We've, we've been doing all sorts of things like supplying uh, PPE because of failures of the national supply chain uh, to materialise, uh, providing food parcels, uh, uh, setting up a hotline so that uh, anybody that needed support could get uh, instant contact with us and we could make sure support was done. Altering our whole neighbourhood support arrangements, not just the council itself, but working with health partners, with housing provider partners to make sure that we were in the best place possible to be able to provide support to people. One of the questions, you talked a lot about uh, vulnerable people and rough sleepers there, so one of the questions that's come up a, a few times from businesses is obviously what happens now? Um, do, the, do those homeless people, rough sleepers, go back onto the street and is there a plan for, for helping them and continuing to help them? Well, hopefully not. Um, uh, let's be honest about this, is that even though there was accommodation available, we did not succeed in getting every rough sleeper uh, off the streets. And something we've known for a long time, for, for a lot of people this, uh, I'm not sure you could call it a lifestyle choice, but it becomes a lifestyle habit and uh, getting people off the streets in, when it becomes a lifestyle habit uh, becomes very, very difficult indeed. Of course, that's associated with uh, other issues that uh, many of those individuals would face. We found that people we did accommodate effectively couldn't cope with uh, the environment and uh, uh, a small number of people left, a small number of people were effectively evicted. So we weren't able, uh, sadly, to meet the needs of uh, everybody. But what we have been able to do for the people that we have accommodated is to work with those people with support packages and uh, for a lot of them have been able to move them on into more permanent accommodation. Um, Again, I think it's something to do with the state of this, the country is that as one person leaves into a, a more secure accommodation, somebody else takes the, their place. So there is a, a, a turnover here. Uh, but what we're trying to do now is that for people that we cannot find stable or cannot support into stable accommodation, post the hotel accommodation, is uh, using a bed every night to make sure that there is, is the offer to everybody of a bed every night, even if they don't take it. Um, I, guess, I guess one of the uh, major issues around that is going to be a um, problem that you've raised a, a number of times already, which is is the, the impact on future funding as a result of the crisis and, and support from central government. And um, what, what's sort of the immediate impact on the council from, from funding issues and, and uh, how can you try and resolve that? I'll, I'll go into a little aside, if you don't mind, uh, before that, which is following on from the previous question, and, and, and actually the very first question is that uh, one thing that was reported to me quite early this morning is that uh, 
uh, particularly on market street, uh, uh, an increase in beggars, which we've not seen in any number for any period of time. And I suppose one of the messages uh, I'll give uh, uh, over and over and over again to people is don't give money to beggars. If you want to support homeless people, give it to big, uh, give it to big change or directly to the many really good voluntary organisations and charities that are supporting uh, home, homeless people. Um, and having gone into that uh, distraction, I will, I will now turn to what we can do, uh, uh, money. And um, we are facing a, a financial uh, black hole. Uh, some of the services I've talked about, particularly um, social care, adult social care, was chronically underfunded in the, in the first place. And uh, if we face severe budget cuts, how are we going to manage that? I, I really don't know. And Manchester is not unique in that respect. Um, pretty much every local authority in the country is in exactly the uh, same position of facing an enormous financial crisis. I think the uh, local government association put the uh, order of that financial crisis at about ten billion pounds uh, across across the country. Manchester, in our last return to government. I was talking about uh, a, a mixture of uh, extra expenditure and loss of income of around 170 million pounds uh, this year. And that's against a, a total budget of six, uh, 660 uh, million or, or thereabouts. So an enormous hole in our uh, budget. So uh, unless we get uh, financial support from government, then our ability to cope uh, We'll probably manage this year just about, we'll scrape through this year, but our ability to manage uh, next year will be, will be almost impossible, really. And are, are there any conversations underway that are in any way sympathetic with government about that? Or well, they give the impression yeah, of being in a blind panic about everything at the moment? So. Uh, there are lots of, there is really uh, lots of discussions taking place. Uh, Local government is collectively making representations to uh, government. We are giving regular returns to government. Our next one is due, financial returns. Our next one is due at the end of uh, this month. But uh, the discussions not only involve more money, when we clearly need more money, uh, adult social care need more money before the crisis, never mind after the uh, crisis. So those discussions are taking place, but we're also uh, discussions taking place about how local government can manage its finances uh, uh, differently, in, in particular, uh, whether we can move away from annualised budgets. And unlike central government, local government has to balance its budget in year, every year. And it, the situation we face at the moment, being able to balance our budget over, say, a four or five year period of time, uh, would help enormously. And in a similar way to what government does, but of course, uh, government never balances its budget, so uh, we have to. Yeah, I, I suppose if you had the luxury of government and being able to sell 100 year, 200 year bonds, that would be transformative well, as well. I, I, I'd say to a large extent, if local government was running national government, I think we might be in a far better place. Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned the Dean's Gate closure, uh, and again, a, a number of people have asked. Um, there are a number of Thomas Street, I think, is now is now closed. Um, so, what other plans are underway for making the city more uh, cycle and walking walking friendly? And how, in addition to the road closures, can you make that more of a general um, way of life? I guess in the city centre. I think we uh, distinguish between being in the city centre and getting to the city centre. It's clearly. Uh, once you're in the city centre, apart from uh, people who have um, mobility impairments uh, or uh, are uh, physically frail, who, f who can't walk any significant uh, distance, once you're in the city centre, for the vast majority of people, it's, it's walkable. Um, you know, I, th I think from one end of Deansgate uh, right down to... Uh, Trinity Way is about 0 0.7 of a mile. This is not a, a vast amount of space, and that's what said it is that for once you get into the city centre, we want to make it a pedestrian dominated area. Now, we're not going to be daft about that. We recognise that uh, there are lots of people who live in the city centre need to be able to 
service where they live. Lots of businesses need uh, servicing. Uh, public transport needs to operate within the city centre to be able to get around the city centre. So we, we have to try and plan this and manage it as carefully as we can. But uh, the, the real intention is within all those constraints, we make it as pedestrian dominated and as pedestrian friendly uh, as we possibly can. Uh, in terms of getting to the city centre, and bearing in mind uh, we need tens of thousands of people to be able to get to the city centre uh, every day, then uh, we don't want people as far as possible commuting in the private car and that's what's happening at the moment. The big impact of uh, COVID-19 is people getting off public transport and into the car. We, we don't want that to uh, happen. Um, that certainly does mean encouraging uh, walking, which is the second biggest modal transfer we've seen uh, from public transport. Certainly encouraging cycling and having uh, and look at cycling for the long term. That we we do need uh, the sort of schemes that we've de developed up uh, Oxford Road, Mildenslow Road that we're putting in place on the Chalton Cycleway. We need uh, that sort of quality. Uh, to make sure that we not only grow cycling, but we maintain it as a, a form of travelling into the city centre. At the same time, we, we need to be doing things away from the city centre as well. Uh, not everybody wants to make that particular journey. We need to uh, support them. But I, I think the big issue for the city centre around getting to it is how we are able to get public transport back operating in any no normal sort of way, because uh, with, without that is that we really uh, cannot uh, say, safely sustain the number of people that need to travel into the city. Um, I, the big questions around that, uh, there are questions about uh, social distancing rules, the impact that's had now that uh, everybody's required to wear uh, face coverings and the extent of that which makes, uh, makes a difference. But uh, buses operating at each individual vehicle at 20% capacity is not going to sustain us in the long term. So would you like to see uh, that some of the social distancing rules on, on public transport changed, uh, particularly now we have the, the masks as, as compulsory, but I understand it, there, was, there, was, there was broad acceptance of the masks, masks this morning, uh, probably more than people were expecting. Yeah, I, I think uh, we should be doing uh, that. Is uh, uh, Clearly, we always want to have this evidence-based. And we know that other countries, for example, don't operate a, a two-meter uh, rule. And even for a two-meter uh, rule, that's largely to do with people uh, looking at each other or, or breathing at each other face-to-face -face for an extended uh, period of time. I think probably we ought to have uh, a, a more sophisticated understanding of social distancing uh, how it needs to work and, and for the time being it does need to work. Uh, I don't think we're a stage yet or anywhere near a stage yet where we can move completely away from social distancing uh, but I think it does have to be uh, less extreme and more practical. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, though probably completely fallacious video that went out on NHK the Jap Japanese TV that explained the difference between infection here and in, in Japan was because all of our peas were plosive and therefore you were spitting on people all the time, whereas in Japan, obviously, they wouldn't treat you doing such a thing. Uh, <laughs> so that face-to-face -face thing is very important. Um, Emma from the wonderful Forsyth Music Shop um, asks about, will there be a completion of the A56 pop-up cycle route? Um, uh, well, look, we've put uh, our submission in for the uh, government's uh, uh, active travel route, and we, we bid for some thousand pounds out of what's currently just over three million pound pot and what we've tended to concentrate on are where we can fill gaps in existing uh, provision or uh, invest in walking and cycling in some parts of the city that have had very uh, very little investment so and we can't do we, we, we can't do everything that's uh, uh, there are choices that have to be made here most of the choices we have made are um, on the entirely choices where, first of all, we can improve cycling and walking uh, quickly, and all our schemes have 
time to come up and in. Uh, we can get long term benefits as, as, so that we can uh, it's, it's the fullness of time in terms of uh, cycling. Out. Um, I, I, I have to say, I have some doubts about uh, pop up cycling, and we'll see how it goes in uh, uh, other places. But I'm fairly certain, and I've just seen others comment, come up, flash, uh, flash up. But if we'd gone out six months ago and said we were going to put up uh, pop up cycle lanes just uh, with cones to shield people from uh, traffic, there would have been an absolutely uproar about the safety of, uh, of doing that. And I'm not sure what's changed in the apart from the COVID crisis in between. Yeah, it'll be interesting as more traffic goes back on the road, how sustainable it is. Well, I think there is another there is another issue there as well, uh, Vaughan, is, is that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the data, uh, that basically uh, road traffic has been uh, cars, not obviously not public transport, but cars have been uh, as uh, over the last few weeks have been growing faster than uh, anything else. And uh, that means if we do take out lots of road capacity, uh, then first of all, it means we will get back to congestion a lot quicker. Um, so uh, I, I think that has got to be a concern, but it's also, um, uh, for some of the, these routes, it is bus lanes that are being taken out and that's making it far more difficult for a, a lot of people who don't want to cycle, that the bus is their only choice to be able to get to be able to get to work. So uh, I, I think there is, a, I, I think it's more complicated than it's often uh, presented about how we uh, maximize the ability of people to move around uh, where not every choice is available to everybody, but at the same time, try and make sure that we don't increase congestion and uh, go back to having uh, dreadful air quality. Okay, Mo moving on from cycling. Um, we're looking potentially at somewhere around July the 4th, July the 6th for bars and pubs to start opening. Um, what are you looking at in terms of how they can open given the likely social distancing? Is there, are there plans for more use of, of public realm or open space areas? Uh, how can the hospitality industry be, be helped, especially well, as the furlough scheme is reduced? I, well, I, th I think you've uh, answered the question for me really in the way you've uh, <laughs> phrased the question. But, uh, although clearly a lot of uh, food and beverage are at night time, we do have a, uh, uh, the City Council have a a nighttime economy working group. We're working with businesses. In some cases, for example, the uh, uh, the Gay and Lesbian Village. We're working with uh, local business associations in those those areas. Uh, but a big part of this is how we can create more outdoor space for venues so, so that they are able to operate uh, using that outside space for uh, serving people and for people to consume. Clearly, there are issues we have to address around planning and licensing that we are uh, we are working uh, working through. Uh, we've also again been talking to government about the powers we would want to have in order to be able to do that uh, effectively and, and quickly, and again in a safe way. But even if we do all of that, and you will know that uh, lots and lots of operators have said that if they have to maintain uh, a two meter rule, then they uh, they simply will not be able to uh, function. I, I can think of a, a couple of pubs on Portland Street, both of which I'm very fond of, that with a two metre rule, that's about two people in there. And that, that's, if that, yeah. it's, <laughs> that's not basically you can run a business, is it? <laughs> well, it's especially, it's, even if you can do it in the, in the bar, you can't get in through the corridors from the entrance, though, can you? Well, that, 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 that's right. And, uh, on Portland Street where you've got bus lanes outside and so on, the, the ability to create a, a large amount of uh, outside space is quite limited. Is there so, actual... If we go back to the question, is that it, what we're trying to do is to work with businesses to identify where we can create that additional space so that they can operate uh, using outside space. Is there much guidance or help actually coming from central government on, on loosening up some of the legal restrictions around the nighttime economy, around bars and restaurants anyway, um, to, to allow you to, to, to help the businesses have that freedom? I, I think, as I said, uh, 
we're in uh, dialogue uh, with government and on some of this uh, we've just made a joint representation with Westminster City Council uh, around uh, how we might be able to do this and do it in a, in, in effective way so it, it is something we're working on but it, it is clearly has an urgency uh, uh, about it that uh, uh, particularly for using outdoor spaces or uh, that uh, this is the time to do it when businesses can get back up and running uh, as well as using the space of course the other thing we're talking to businesses about is how they can put up uh, temporary structures demountable structures that uh, given that occasionally we get rain even in summer uh, that again continue to use it uh, uh, in all weathers Again, we're going to be, as I said at the beginning, talking more about that in the Q&A tomorrow. Um, at the point that the virus struck, I guess uh, Manchester was, in terms of buildings, growing as fast probably as it's ever done, I would think, in the period just before the 2008 crash. Um, certainly the number of hotels was increasing, if not exponentially, then at a huge rate, and the amount of residue that was going up. Um, what have you seen? Have, have people started to withdraw some of those plans? Have, have they started to have they, have they tried to get on faster with them so so they're first to market? And um, what what what's the impact you're starting to see at this point on, on those builds? Uh, I th what what we're seeing is that certainly on the buildings themselves uh, that virtually all of those major projects have been back on site for some time now. So uh, they're they're back uh, building. Uh, that there are still new proposals coming forward. Uh, so uh, uh, a number in, in pre-planning that we're beginning to uh, see. So the pipeline doesn't seem to be drying up. Um, I think over the past two or three weeks, certainly, uh, both in, the, um, and this does vary around the city, but for, if you take residential, that uh, uh, both the lettings and sales markets seem to be doing relatively well. So. Uh, there is still, uh, I think, pent up demand, probably pent up demand in part because people have been waiting to move actually because of COVID-19. Uh, but yeah, there does seem to be still um, a, a strong development pipeline and a, a demand element. Uh, clearly, uh, the workspace of the future is going to be probably, at least in the uh, next few months, a bit different to the workspace of the, uh, of the past. And, uh, I think we are, whilst we are going to see more flexible uh, working at the same time, there is likely to be, at least in the short term, a move away from things like uh, hot desking for obvious reasons. So uh, there are there are going to be some factors that would uh, lead to a, a reduction in space requirements, but then others that will lead to an increase in space requirements. Uh, my guess is that that will probably all balance out somewhere in the middle. Do you think the amount of resi that was being built is, is going to continue? Because I think one of the things that I guess we've seen over the last eight, nine weeks for the remaining shops and, and those places that are doing takeaways actually are local resident populations staying local and, and shopping local and, and using their local amenities. So uh, the greater the, the resi population, the, the better that is and the easier that is. Well, yeah, I think the, uh, the residential popula population growth will uh, continue and it goes back to a, uh, an early part of this discussion for uh, that uh, resident population, a very, very large number of them are able to easily walk to work uh, uh, every day. So uh, no lengthy commuting journeys uh, for, for them. It, is, uh, it, it can quite often be a, a five, ten minute walk to get to work. And I, I think that desire to have the, uh, mixed use neighborhoods wh where people live and work relatively close together i think that's that's going to uh, continue and indeed i would have thought that uh, uh, one of the impacts of covid19 will be to push even more for people to want to uh, live in those sorts of circumstances rather than having to make long commuting journeys uh, you, I, I mentioned hotels in, in the in the past question one of obviously the main factors for uh, retail particularly um, has been international tourists uh, and, and uh, visitors both from both from Europe and increasingly from the Far East and, and from uh, the subcontinent. Um, certainly with that latter segment we're not likely to see a return for, for a number of years. Um, are we going to see some of those hotels mothballed? Are we going to see some impact on uh, how do we replace those, those visitors from uh, abroad? 
Well, I'm not sure it's going to be many years before uh, visitors from abroad um, re reappear. Uh, and clearly there are aspects of what would um, bring visitors from abroad. And we've talked about food and beverage. Clearly, uh, arts and culture are going to be uh, inevitably one of the uh, last areas to, and sport uh, to get fully back to uh, uh, normal because of it's a bit difficult to go to a football uh, uh, match and socially distance at the same uh, same time unless they kind of cut the uh, attendance by 75 percent which I don't, I don't think quite from a spectator point of uh, view uh, gigs concerts and so on uh, it'd be a while become, before that comes back but uh, and there are there are lots of different views on uh, and this and it says my guess is probably as good as anybody else's or as bad as anybody uh, else's but i can see that potentially quite a, a pent-up demand uh, for people to be able to uh, travel now not everybody will want to do that but uh, i i suspect as we are at the moment that the uh, uh, the moment government says that they've uh, agreed uh, travel corridors to Spain, Greece, Portugal, Italy, uh, etc. That there will be a, a flood of bookings for people uh, wanting to go on their holidays. Well, if that's what people here are going to do, the same will be in other places uh, as, as well. So I, I think uh, uh, foreign visitors could appear faster than uh, you might expect. I think, like, as far as hotels go. Uh, go I think it's something else we have to bear in mind at the, the time the crisis struck we were under hoteled so uh, uh, again there might be a balancing factor over that within the uh, uh, next uh, few months maybe uh, running up to a year and then one of the other areas i suppose will be hit certainly massively over the next year is student numbers which again have had a huge impact on the economy over the last decade and, and uh, and beyond, but um, when, when you're talking about potentially 80% of international students as University of Manchester is not coming at least for next year, um, are we able to be fairly sure that we'll be able to bring them back within two, three years time? Uh, I think if uh, our universities continue to have the, uh, the quality product, uh, then yes, I think uh, uh, we will. And, uh, that Royal Northern College of Music uh, is one of the leading conservatoires anywhere in the world. If it maintains that, then students will want to uh, come here. The University of Manchester, uh, I can't remember what its current ranking is, in, in, uh, it's certainly world top 40 university. If it maintains that, then people will, will, will want to come here. Uh, not just undergraduates, of course, but uh, uh, equally importantly, uh, research students and our other universities, Manchester Metropolitan, Salford, whilst they are less dependent on uh, uh, international students, uh, ag again, have particular expertises that uh, will attract students to come back. And I think ultimately it's the, the quality of the product they have to offer uh, and the willingness of uh, us as a city to continue to welcome people as well. So some of the things we've been talking to the universities about is how we get messages out to uh, international students so we're going to look after them and uh, Manchester it will be a safe place for them to come. Yeah I think that's that's overall the message that we're trying to get out through a lot of the marketing through Marketing Manchester and the practical stuff that, that um, you as a council yeah. and, and we as Cisco are supporting with around actually just reassuring people that it's going to be clean and safe and, and you know it's a good place to come back to where there actually is a substantial amount of fear at the moment. How well, yes, and, uh, and clearly that, that, uh, that's hard work, uh, but it's important work because um, the university is an important part to bring income for the universities. They bring money into the city, but I think they uh, bring far much more than that as well. Is uh, uh, they, they bring uh, uh, ideas, they uh, bring diversity, they bring those ingredients that make Manchester the city that it is. Uh, there, there have been a few good things that come out of it. I noticed that, again, walking around this morning, as, as I have over the last few weeks, that the city is probably cleaner than it's ever been because there hasn't been much footfall. So, uh, is there a way that we can actually try and keep it that clean over the next few few months? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, look, uh, I, I think 
there are a number of things we can do. Uh, first of all, I, I think uh, this is something we've discussed regularly in the past, but uh, businesses need to take more responsibility for outside their front door and not just inside their fr uh, front door. I think getting premises open is that uh, uh, the streets might be cleaner, but uh, uh, I went round town a, a, a couple of weeks ago in areas like uh, City Centre, uh, Confield Park and so on, where basically because bars weren't open, people were making their own. And the amount of litter and rubbish was far more than you would normally uh, normally get. So I think getting business <coughs> normal will help us uh, keep the place clean. Clearly, we've been able to do lots of uh, deep cleaning, lots of... Uh, pavement and other repairs to generally make the place uh, uh, look better and, and hopefully that means that we are now kind of ahead of the game and it's going to be easier to keep up. If we keep on having uh, sharp thunderstorms like we did a couple of hours ago that always helps keeps the keeps the pavements very clear as well which is a good thing. Oh well, well we, didn't have, we didn't have a thunderstorm in uh, Crunsell so I missed that. It was a, it was a crack of thunder and then rain fell from the sky as it does occasionally but um, always a good thing when when uh, people need to go into retail and, and so on. Um, I mean, where do you think, I know we're all sort of putting a finger in the air a little bit, but retail obviously was was gently reducing in the amount of space it had in the city, broadly being replaced by F&B. Do you think that's going to continue, speed up? Um, do you think we're going to see new types of businesses arise? And if so, what? I, I think retail will uh, uh, change, certainly. Um, I, I think the, we, we saw, as well as F&B, uh, we saw different sorts of niche retail uh, developing, things like lifestyle uh, stores and so on, often combining F&B with uh, uh, retail as well. Uh, we've seen the effectively the uh, shopper showroom rather than a sales, uh, sales room. And again, uh, there were certainly pre-COVID plans for people like the Hut Group, for example, to develop uh, that sort of product uh, within the uh, market. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, retail will continue. It will be different. I, I think and hope we will see uh, growth of in independence, that landlords will have to change their thinking around things like covenants in order to support uh, independent retail because I think that is what will uh, that people will increasingly look for when they want to go out uh, shopping they want to look for things that are uh, distinctive things that are are different and I, I think that actually ought to give uh, a really promising future for city centre retail again uh, the, probably the biggest single change in uh, uh, retail over the last 20 years is uh, less F&B, but the um, growth of things like uh, supermarkets, convenience stores in the city centre, where we've gone from, I think, what were two, uh, if that, uh, uh, 25 years ago to uh, I don't know how many of the, uh, at the moment. And I, th I think that will uh, continue as well. But even in that area, I think uh, uh, it was very sad to see uh, a long year ago that we will see again in food retail and so on. Uh, a growth of uh, uh, niche specialist shopping within the city centre. Um, more broadly, I guess what there is that fear of a second wave. Um, what can the city first of all do to to help prevent that second wave? And then, I think as a final question, um, what are you looking to to businesses to do to uh, let them have continual growth and success over the next six months, but also to try and help keep, people keep healthy? Well, there is a risk of a second spike. Uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, other epidemics over the winter, so uh, a flu epidemic, but that's a permanent risk in uh, any uh, winter. Uh, clearly, there is no vaccine yet uh, for COVID-19. Uh, there are no cures or uh, there don't appear to be any drugs yet that appear to be uh, serious uh, uh, mitigations. Uh, COVID-19 may well be like a, a lot of other viruses. Over the summer, it, it could also just disappear. We, we don't know what's going to happen from that point of view. It may be something that we have to learn to live with in the uh, long term. And if we have to learn to live with it in the long term, it might mean uh, 
we have to make some of the good habits that we've developed over the last three months, like vastly improved hygiene, uh, have to become permanent habits, not uh, uh, temporary habits. And of course, if we uh, if we do that, not only will it help protect us from COVID-19, it will help protect us from a whole range of other uh, thing, things as well. So uh, I, th I think around our, our, our personal behaviours and so on, that there are some uh, long-term changes that we, we can make as a society that will uh, make it safe for people to go about their daily business, people safe for people to go to work uh, on a permanent basis. And I think that's really the direction that we're going in. For those of us who are anti-social Englishmen, the, the end of um, being forced to kiss people on cheeks when you walk into a meeting will be oh, an absolute yeah. delight, frankly. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, kissing, hugging, uh, shaking, uh, shaking hands, uh, and those sorts of things. I, I think probably will not not rush back. I'm not saying that they will never uh, uh, come back, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, the hug could be virtual for quite a while in terms of people you don't know particularly well and uh, don't mix with. So. Uh, and some of that's sad, really, because uh, uh, clearly um, that sort of engagement makes uh, a happy society. But we, we'll, we'll find other ways of uh, of doing it. And that's something people have been doing throughout the crisis is finding ways to uh, continually to uh, socially engage, uh, even within the, the restrictions of being uh, stuck in their own front room all the time. And some of those patterns of behaviour, I think we will maintain for... A period of time and, and not everybody will we know that uh, but uh, I think as long as the probably 80% of the population the, the majority of the population do maintain that that should allow us to be able to uh, keep the virus under control and to get on with our daily lives. And the virtual hug actually is a of course the, the key theme in the city's marketing campaign as well which is uh, rolled out at the end of last week, I believe. Well, yes, and uh, th there are a whole range of things that have happened in the digital world that will be uh, permanent features of uh, of our lives. So, uh, if I t take council services uh, uh, as an example of that, is it is extremely unlikely uh, that we will op reopen the customer service centre to. Uh, drop in visitors that we will expect as we have now that there is some form of triage that initial contact is is phone or text or uh, email and there is a triage before you get to face-to-face -to -face, uh, meetings something that uh, uh, doctor surgeries have, uh, have been doing and uh, other medical practices and if you think about it if, if you think of your local GP practice do you really want to go and sit in a waiting room full of uh, ill people when you're exactly. all yourself um, and it's probably not the best place to be really so actually it's something that uh, uh, allows a, a first step check on what it is uh, what people really need I think helps them and help, helps us but those changes I think will be uh, permanent changes that uh, to a large extent that will have come out of this crisis and probably uh, changes that will allow us to serve people better yeah, I think you're going to see increased integration. It's not an either or between physical and digital. I mean, you're certainly seeing in no, more, more restaurants no, and more come uh, back uh, using apps for ordering and so on. I, I, I think that that's that's right. And uh, again, for council services, uh, there are clearly some that like libraries, a bit, bit difficult to do without being face to face. Uh, there are others where ultimately uh, that uh, social workers will need to see people that need support and, and so on. Uh, there are going to be lots of examples where there needs to be face to face contact. There are now. Uh, clearly, we have domiciliary care workers, social workers, others going into people's homes now because the, there is a need uh, to do that. But uh, for a lot of those, what you'll be able to do is an assessment of that need. Uh, before you have to make uh, the, the physical step and I think it is that that will not only help uh, keep people safe but also I think will lead to uh, better and better targeted services as well. And I suppose managing the digital divide there is going to be the interesting one because people who are disadvantaged actually don't have well, uh, digital services. I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right um, and 
we do have a number of recovery work streams in, in the city council one is the community recovery uh, work stream i think what we do about the digital divide has got to be part of uh, that because uh, again uh, i think one of the things the covid crisis has done is to really emphasize that that digital divide is uh, very very real and it's not just uh, uh, you know, older people who are not uh, uh, that keen on using uh, digital devices or are not familiar with it. Now we've got uh, uh, young people who, it, it's no good saying download your uh, next lesson because they've got nothing to download it uh, uh, on. So it, it, it operates at a, a, a range of levels. And I think the task we have to find is not to uh, basically uh, avoid doing things digitally, but to make sure that those people are supported, if need be, by providing uh, equipment, to pro providing connections that they're supported to become digitally engaged so that they are not divided. Thank you. And um, finally, what's your message to businesses in the city centre uh, in, in the current climate? Well, look, uh, I think for businesses in the, uh, in the city centre, that Manchester was growing really, really quickly uh, before uh, COVID struck, uh, that if we work together, uh, that we will get back to businesses growing rapidly again. Uh, I have no doubt that we have potentially a very, very difficult uh, time. And that's what the figures say. The figures say that we are facing uh, a period of uh, quite deep recession that will really have uh, a, an impact. But I, I think it is continue to work with us, continue to be uh, innovative, uh, continue to try uh, new uh, new things. Uh, and if, if we do that, if we if we struggle together to get through this difficult period of time, then I think there are good times to look forward to. So uh, stay confident, stay optimistic. Uh, and of course stay safe. Thank you very much Sir Richard uh, and as I said the next uh, Q&A we've got is around the nighttime economy that's tomorrow. Um, keep in touch with our communications and with our website citycode.com uh, where we have a rolling program of pages which are all the latest advice for different sectors uh, of how to reopen, how to safely socially distance uh, and also how to apply for the various grants that are still available but are, are running out of time now. Um, Thank you again for coming and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.